this is a grand experiment. Um, again, we know that we're impacting infants in ways that we're seeing. You know, I, we've been in the digital age long enough to see what the two-year-old raised with a tablet looks like now as a 20-year-old. And, and is it any wonder that ADHD rates have exponentially spiked uh, by some estimates 500%? There were gaming studies, fMRI studies that also showed neurophysiological impacts. Now, the one study that was at the Indiana University Medical School, they showed in just two weeks of excessive violent gaming, um, prefrontal cortex changes. The good news was at that age, these were uh, 18 to 25 year old gamers. Mm -hmm. They did show some, because there was neuroplasticity, they did show that some of those effects were seemingly reversible if the gaming stopped. Um, but essentially, we're not really sure because we don't have many multi-decade longitudinal studies to show this. So this is a grand experiment. Um, again, we know that we're impacting infants in ways that we're seeing. You know, I, We've been in the digital age long enough to see what the two-year-old raised with a tablet looks like now as a 20-year-old. And, and is it any wonder that ADHD rates have exponentially spiked? Uh, by some estimates, 500%. Endeavor Rx was granted clearance by the FDA based on data in more than 600 children from five clinical studies in ADHD. After four weeks of Endeavor Rx treatment for 25 minutes per day, five days per week, one third of children no longer had a measurable attention deficit on at least one computer-based measure of objective attention. There were no serious adverse events seen in any clinical trials of Endeavor Rx. 9.3% of patients experienced treatment-related adverse events including frustration, headache, dizziness, emotional reactions, nausea, and aggression. Um, is it any coincidence that we're seeing all these other issues happening? Um, so, so it's more than just, hey, little Johnny loves his video games and Susie's on social media too much. Uh, it's really... It's really um, mind shaping and, and the, the other part that we're seeing now with social media is because of social learning theory and social contagion we're also seeing i write about this quite a bit in digital madness the digital social contagion effects where uh, people who are unwell and are performatively unwell um, are getting millions and billions of views and followers everything from the TikTok tourette's phenomenon to mm -hmm. dissociative identity disorder um, to borderline personality disorder all seems to now be exploding at the same time that we have influencers that are um, espousing these psychiatric uh, issues. And then I've watched some of the influencers and I would question whether they authentically have the disorders or whether this is a way that their, you know, their, their, their brain has associated that I'm getting more likes and followers the more performative, performatively I may be acting. Yeah. So we have that other as another dynamic that's also contemporaneously happening. So when I wrote Digital Heroin, that 7 million views and shares in the New York Post, that, that got me on Good Morning America and CNN and then uh, uh, um, the CBS Evening News, a lot of national media where I had to really defend, can this be like heroin? And, and the brain imaging research, the fMRI research was crystal clear that the effects on the brain and the, the reward centers and the prefrontal cortex uh, exactly mirrored substance addiction in, in terms of what was happening with our devices. So that was sort of phase one. So that's 2016. I'm um, this Paul Revere saying that, hey, be careful that this stuff can, can be habit forming. And then over the next few years, it was beginning to see what is that habituation leading to? What is the societal price and, and also the mental health uh, byproduct of that habituation? So now we started seeing hey, is it a coincidence that depression rates are skyrocketing, suicide rates are skyrocketing, the loneliness epidemic is a thing, um, deaths of despair has become a thing. You know, the CDC was terming this phrase, deaths of despair, overdose suicides and chronic alcoholism. And, and the other phenomenon, generational phenomenon that I, started, that I started connecting the dots with was that if you looked at the generational cohorts from baby boomers to Gen Xers to millennials to Gen Zs, um, each progressively younger generation was getting more and more mentally unwell by the, by the psychiatric metrics. And, and so ironically, the more plugged in the generation, the more unwell they were psychiatrically, and highest rates of depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. self-harm, all the metrics that we measure self-harm were exploding. 
uh, correlating to our uh, digital age. And and so the research started really showing that. So there were those aspects that started saying, not only are we falling in love with our devices, but it, a phrase that I like to use is, um, as we were getting mad for our devices, it seemed that our devices were driving us mad. Um, and, and so exploring that. And then there were larger societal aspects, you know, everything that we're seeing in terms of the... Uh, the, the schism in our society, the, the, the polarization that's happening and sure. beginning to understand how algorithmically fueled content uh, is baked in to be polarizing because we know that the more, most intense en emotions, fear and anger, lead to increased engagement. And so mm. I started understanding deeper uh, political and societal dynamics. So so then it seemed, and, and, and I also uh, discovered this really wonderful interview with uh, Aldous Huxley back in 1958 with Mike Wallace, where he talked about loving our enslavement and that in this mm -hmm. future dystopia, we're going to learn, we're going to love our enslavement. And, and I started really viewing the, the process that had been unfolding either by design or by accident, but mm -hmm. I would say probably more by design. I, well, I think the initial design aspect was monetization, right? There sure. was like, let's make these platforms more engaging. And I think the rest of it was Frankenstein monsterish, where we didn't quite realize, or, or I think the folks designing big tech initially didn't realize what the Frankenstein would evolve into in terms of how that would have these deeply penetrating effects on society. Speaking of brain altering, you told me that you work in brain plasticity these days and what our devices, electronics, online experiences are doing to our, the plasticity of our brains. Sure. So how, how is tech changing us already? Uh, everything, I mean, that's it. I mean, look, you play, many of you I'm sure know this, you play 40 hours of Call of Duty and your brain is different than it was before. And that's not all bad. I mean, people who enter into like, you play 40 hours of Call of Duty, guess what? Your, your visual acuity is sharper. Your strategic thinking has changed. I mean, these things, you fundamentally see the world differently than you did before. Harnessing these things into our consumer technology and sort of building the, the way we design our technology, doing that from a neuroscience perspective, that we're going to engage with this technology and we get to proactively write how our brains are going to change because they are. So it was, it was get people and get people hooked, engaged, because that's how we monetize. But then it was, oh, now we're, we're doing these, um, not only mind shaping, but ideologically altering um, um, platforms, potentially either yeah. via bad actors or big tech themselves sometimes. And, um, and, and I'll conclude it by saying it, it looked to me like now we were suffering from a form of a societal Stockholm syndrome where not only had we been taken hostage by, you know, we'd been taken hostage and our lives had re been very reduced to sedentary screen staring um, beings, which were not really genetically designed to be. Mm -hmm. But not only had we, but as Aldous Huxley had said, we'd not only fallen in love with our captivity, but we began to deify and idolize our captors. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the Steve Jobses of the world became rock stars and, and they became cultural icons. And so that's, I think, the cultural moment that we're in where we're, we're sort of trapped and enslaved, uh, you know, byproducts of other people's tinkering algorithms and the younger, more vulnerable don't even realize that they're swimming in this water yeah. and, and lives will be getting smaller. And just even yesterday, the study came out, uh, University of Michigan has been doing 40 years of asking teenagers whether their lives have meaning or purpose. And, and, you know, after 2012, I guess that, that bar graph has been spiking and spiking. And I guess last year or this year's numbers that came out were, I forgot what their exact percentage was, but young people in particular are feeling the most hopeless and their lives have no meaning and purpose. And, 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 uh, and here we are <laughs> to talk about Here we are. Uh, yeah. On that positive note. Uh, <laughs> on that feel good message. Yeah. yeah. We need to take a look at Singularity University. These are the people behind so much of the shift that we're seeing toward the technology-based everything world.
founded by Ree Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis in 2008 as a non-profit, Singularity University was said to be aimed at individuals wanting to understand how they could use technology to tackle global challenges. In a 2010 article from the New York Times about Singularity University and the Singularity Movement, a journalist is reported as saying that he sees the Singularity as a grand tech nerd dream in which engineers, inventors, and innovators of every stripe create the greatest of all reset buttons. He says that the techies seem to want a deus ex machina, a god from a machine, to make everything right again. They have offshoots all around the world, furthering disruptive technologies in finance, medicine, manufacturing, the synthetic biology takeover of the food system. It's a complete shift of the world, really, moving us to a place where the core of everything is the machine. For a decade now, they've been running leaders of corporations, investors, and medical professionals through their executive programs, getting them all prepared and geared up for this world that we're now facing where everything goes technology and we're expected to shed our human lives and connections in exchange for their digital version. In their world, robotics, the internet of everything, mRNA vaccines and gene therapies, brewed up stem cell drugs, vat brewed foods, and AI driven vertical farms fed by biotech nutrients, they plan to augment your immune system more than they already have been and to transform education and employment, democratizing and digitizing, bringing the people of the world into their hive mind, which provides the intelligence, the data needed to program the machine to their long sought technical singularity. The clear COVID winner is the technocracy. With this one reported virus built up by the propaganda mass media machine and all of its influential tentacles, suddenly all of the tech that they've had ready and waiting is being accepted by the molded minds of the masses. We need to tell people, and this has to stop because we cannot move forward into their future where all of the life in the world is intended to be rewritten, and it's already happening. I would really appreciate your help getting this information out to people. You can find the link to the sources in the description box below. Thank you for listening.